Agriculture for many farmers and crofters is a way of life, and at times achieving a good work-life balance can be challenging. Sometimes things out with your control can force you to change your business. At Hawkhill Croft near John O'Groats, we learn how change was needed and how it has improved the work-life balance of crofter Sally Crow. I'd been in, what happened was I'd been in New Zealand. I was on the Scottish shearing team. I was one of the two wool handlers at the World Shearing Championships. I was 15th in the world. Came home on a massive high because Gavin Much had won. So it was the first, second Scot to win in the Southern Hemisphere. It was in Masterton, the home of shearing. It was awesome. You know, I came home on this massive high. Stopped in Australia on the way home to visit some friends. Visited mates in a shearing shed for half an hour one afternoon and I picked up Q fever. Came home, came back to work as normal and just got sick and sick and just went, kept going down and down and down. Couldn't get treatment, they didn't know what it was, hadn't really heard of it much over here. Didn't really get much help, had friends and stuff who helped. Um, thinking back, I should have approached charities for help, RICBI, I could have phoned them. You know, I never thought of it back then because my mental health did suffer quite badly. It wasn't an easy time, you know, I was housebound for three years. I had to go and find my own private health treatment, which worked, thankfully, you know, touch wood, it's worked. I'm not as fit as I was, but here I'm getting older, you know, so I'm never going to be as fit as I was. It forced, it forced me to change what I was doing. And in a way, I'm glad of that now. You know, at the time I maybe wasn't, but in a way I see it as a turning point in my life. I'd been busting my gut working here, there and everywhere, jobbing around, not really any plans. I hadn't really decided what I wanted to do in life. I hadn't really. I thought I was running a croft. You know, I hadn't really figured out what I was going to do with my life. So it did make me. I had to. I had nothing else to do but think for a long time. You know, and we cut the numbers of cattle and sheep right back because I had to. I had no other choice. I had to live. So I had to sell them to live. I'm Sally Crow. I am a crofter at Keith in Caithness. Um, I have. 65 acres, well 30 of my own, and then I rent in another 35 acres from my neighbour on seasonal lets. I run Irish Moyle cattle, a rare breed, and Hell Cheviot yows. We've been here 51 years now, I think it is. So I've been running it since 2004 in my own right. I started off with Texels. We had them for, oh, from when I was at 14, 15, we showed up here at the Highland Show, we used to go down to Lanark with them. We did quite well with them. Loved them, still do love Texels. And I had, I bought cross-continental cattle for doing show calves. Doing, I was trying to breed, just I enjoyed showing, you know, enjoyed, I enjoyed being in that lifestyle, trying to get a couple of prizes and champions and stuff. So it was mainly Belgian blue and limousine crosses I had. And they were lovely, I really enjoyed them. They were good, but changed, what did we change? About seven, eight years ago now we changed breed. It was about 10 years ago, I'd been abroad, I had some health issues when I came home, got sick. Struggled with the Texels because they're big, heavy animals, they need a lot of work. Um, obviously, I was sick, I couldn't work anywhere else. Um, and on a croft at that point, it was only 40 odd acres, so it wasn't big enough to support me. So I did a lot of outside work, I did a lot of rolling wool, bar work, bookkeeping work, lots of little jobs. But then when I got sick, I couldn't do any of that. So I didn't have any money coming in to support the cattle and sheep. Texels, at pedigree level, they need a lot of hard food. They need a lot of vets work and stuff like that, unfortunately, the way they are at the moment. And I just couldn't do that anymore. Um, I wasn't fit at one point. I struggled to even help dad bed up. You know, I remember one day I was able to go out and help dad roll half a bale of straw in a field, in a shed. And that was the first I'd done for three weeks because I just wasn't fit to do anything. So I had to change breeds and had to look at something different. We cut right back down to only three cows, which really isn't sustainable. You know, there wasn't doing anything. We stopped using fertiliser. I stopped using fertiliser because I couldn't afford to put it on. And four years ago, five years ago, I changed to Helcheviot sheep. I'd had them here before. I ran them here at one point before. They suit the ground. You know, they're easy to look after. They don't need much work. We had some blue face Lesters as well. I've got five of them for a hobby. And just, I really like them. They're cute. They're nice, you know, but they're hard work as well. And top of the hill in Caithness, you know, they don't do very well here. They're, they need a bit extra pampering and care for and that, but I like them, so I have them. So I then moved into doing Cheviot Mules, which Blueface 
across the chevia and they work really well here. They're easy to look after, there's no lambing issues. I think I lambed one at a 65 yows this year. We are with zero vet spill this year at lambing time, which is the way I want it to go. Um, the cattle, a friend started showing I, uh, these pictures, these beautiful red and white cows on Facebook. I had no idea what they were and it asked them one day and found out they were Irish Moyles and was lucky enough to be able to buy two from him, a two-year-old heifer and a yearling heifer, considering there's only, at that point, there was only two herds in Scotland. So to be able to buy some from Forfer at that point was incredibly lucky and they've they're good ones as well, you know, they're very good ones. I've bred up now, we have 11 to the bull this year. They're a rare breed from Ireland, we're, we're up to about 1,600 of them. They're pole, naturally polled, that's what the name Maul comes from, mound, for the mound on their heads, so they don't have horns, it makes life easier, you don't have to have a vet visit to dehorn them. Um, they taste amazing. They've got beautiful fat marbling all through them. They, they lend themselves really well to doing beef boxes and lamb boxes, or not lamb boxes, but beef boxes. They're smaller, they're slower maturing, but they suit the kind of style I have here now. You know, I don't, I miss showing cattle. At some point I will show my moilies again. At the moment, I'm just not fit to do it. I don't really want to either at the moment. I'm quite like an easy life, you know, and moilies and hell chivy, it's given me that. So we were conventional farmers here for years, you know, so much fertiliser every year, you take silage off this park, you top it when it gets too long, you roll it, you do everything. And we had good grass, you know, we had really good grass here. We had years ago, um, Jack Dunnett, potato breeder, he used to use our ground to bulk up his potatoes, so it was extra fertilised, you know, it was turned over every couple of years, we were in the whole cycle of refreshing grass and reseeding and everything. Then, as I say, when I got ill, I couldn't afford fertiliser. We were down to only sort of three or four cows and 10 sheep, so it wasn't heavily grazed. And over time, the grass started to, it went, it wasn't good for a year or two. You know, the production did fall for a year or two, but then it started to get better. And I'm like, well, if I'm, by I think the fifth year, I was making about 10 or 11 bales of silage to the acre, which is kind of average. You know, it's a little bit below, but not much. So I figured, why do I bother with it? And I kind of fell into doing this thing. It wasn't organic because we did still spray rashes and stuff, but it wasn't conventional either. We started looking at doing rotational grazing and the first year, this field, I just split in half, you know, put them on one half for two weeks, other half for two weeks. And then I started reading a bit more around it. And we've moved to this year, we do rotational grazing from sort of first week of May right through to we wean because we just don't have enough after we wean but we run all the cattle and sheep or as many of the cattle and sheep together as possible so we had 180 animals in one group they were going on sort of two acres for three days and then being moved and well I mean everybody in Caithness is overwhelmed with grass this year but we've had grass ahead of them all year we're we've split now into different groups I've my lambs are born in the March beginning April I've already got sort of 10 lambs sitting over 45 kilos. Um, I put them up to sort of 52 for the beef, for the lamb boxes, sorry, because um, that gives me a nice sort of 20 kilo gun whole box for cheviot mules, you know, it's maybe lighter for other breeds. Um, but what I've noticed is we haven't reseeded. I've stitched in a couple of bits of clover and some species rich grassland in. But like my silage park now has, what was it, 18 different species of grasses, wild flowers, just natural, it's coming out the seed bank now. Um, we do concentrate, we try to get a lot of clover in, obviously to feed the soil. Um, I had soil samples done this year. The only place that's low, the pH is low, is the new ground I've taken on that was reseeded five years ago. Everywhere else is sitting at a good sort of 5.9 or 6. Cattle are thriving on it, the sheep are thriving on it. I'm moving now towards 100% pasture fed. So it will, hopefully in a couple of years time, it will only be grass that I'm feeding to them. It's going to take time with the sheep, the cattle there, the cattle or the calves, they get some barley at weaning time because they do need that support at that point. They'll always get that. But the sheep, we fed for about two weeks this year, that was all. Um, pre lambing and what I'm going to do now over the next four or five years is select female lines that are doing well, that are managing without the extra feed and cull out the lines that aren't. We tag all the lambs at birth, we use an uh, online app so I weight record regularly so I'm able to see what's, how everything's performing 
we cull out the bottom sort of 10% every year to keep improving and now we're moving on to selecting for body score for mainly between scanning and lambing. So if they can handle that bit, they should be okay the rest of the year as well. And so it's more a natural kind of way. It's, it's, it's what's called regenerative agriculture. You know, I didn't know that's what it was called at the time. It's only in the last sort of four or five years I've discovered that's what it's called. It works for me here. You know, it does, it's not for everybody, but it works for me well here. It's low input. It's less stress, you know. I don't like stress these days. I want to take life easy. I want to have time to enjoy myself. What I'm loving is the nature coming back. You know, we've got the great yellow bumblebee here feeding in pastures and moss carders that are rarely seen up here. I've seen, with pheasants nesting over in the wildflower. We've not had pheasants for years. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a uh, pheasant with chicks on here. We had grey partridge last year and we've had a hen harrier all summer over here and you know we've more and more wildlife coming back which it's what I want to pass on to my little boy. I want to pass, I want William to have something nice um, to hand on, if he wants it, you know, to hand on to him. We started eating our own lamb basically about 11, 12 years ago. We started putting one or two lambs in the freezer every year and enjoyed it, tasted good, you know, eat our own produce because that's, as farmers, the way I see it, we're farmers, we should feed people. We started eating our own beef and lamb, our own lamb to start with. We put a cattle beast in the freezer about eight years ago. She was a heifer that had a problem with her shoulder, so she couldn't go through market. It was, she was genetic, it was born that way, so we couldn't sell her anywhere, so we put her in the freezer. It was lovely, tasted really good. <laughs> And then I started to just posting on Facebook. I was like, yeah, look at this. I'm having my steak for tea. It's my own steak at night. And a couple of people were like, oh, that looks good. I'd like to try it. So I moved mainly down the lamb to start off with because I honestly didn't think I would manage to sell a whole cattle beast. Oh, there's no way I'm going to manage to do that. First year I concentrated on doing lamb, I sold nine in boxes. About four years ago, I thought, you know what? I can make a business. I can really add a bottom end into price on my lambs. Because with boxes, you know, in January, you can say, right, I'm going to sell these boxes at this price. This is how much I'm going to make per lamb. So you can plan ahead. You can make decisions for what you're going to do later on in the year because you know you will have this amount of money coming in. So I concentrated hard on it and I managed, I think I sold 24 as boxes last year, which was, I only had five weathers that weren't, didn't go through as lamb boxes. I also last year was able to sell, we had quite a few stots coming through, so I sold four cattle beasts as boxes. So it was over a hundred boxes in total by the end of the year I sold. And it's just, it's a great feeling. The feedback you're getting from folk when they open up their box and they go, wow, look at this, this is great. And then the next day they're like, we had steak for tea last night or we had sausages for breakfast this morning or we had a lamb sandwich or whatever. They send you pictures and they're like, oh, this is lovely. This is the best I've tasted in years. And it's, a, it's that, for me, it's that direct connection with a customer. And it just, it feels so much more satisfying. And it, it just makes me happy, basically. It just suits what I'm doing here. It works in well. I don't need to carry quite so many on the ground because I know what the stock's going to have. I know what their value is going to be. At the moment, my ewe lambs are all sold locally. Um, as breeding new lambs, because Cheviot mules are in demand breed at the moment as well. If for any reason the sheep market ever dropped um, and new lamb trade wasn't as good, I've got the option to then put them into lamb boxes. I've already got a customer base established. Um, I've already got everything in place, the marketing and everything. It wouldn't take me much to push a wee bit harder, maybe go a wee bit further afield. At the moment, I tend to concentrate on Caithness. Um, but I could go a little bit further afield and sell a bit further south um, and it would be easy enough to put everything into boxes. So it's taken away part of that worry for me that if the market drops for whatever, as we know it can happen, you know, I don't have that worry now that I'm not going to have an income basically from my sheep or my lambs are going to be worth nothing. So it's, it's a good thing to have, I think. Based on her experience, what advice would Sally give to other farmers and crofters across Scotland? Don't be afraid of counselling. I had counselling after a couple of years. 
And it's made a huge difference to my life now. It's turned my thoughts around. I did a mindfulness course. And it made me realise that I want to I want to live my life, I want to enjoy myself. So I've changed my work-life balance. I, I don't, I work nine to five where I can. Um, I rarely work after five o'clock at night, except lambing. You know, certain times of year, yeah, we have to, but I don't work weekends. We do the basics, everything's fed and watered and checked, but I don't plan jobs for the weekend. Where I can help it, sometimes happens. I've got my little boy, he's three and a half now. I want to spend time with him, I want to bring him up not in that whole thing of we have to work, 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 work. You know, it's it's a psych, it is definitely a psychological thing that we are, a lot of farmers are brought up that we have to work hard and we must do this and we have to do that. We don't. We can have time to enjoy ourselves. The whole point of being here is to enjoy what you're doing. And I do, I love what I'm doing now. I love the way I've got the farm set up. I can take days off, I can go visit friends, I can nip out for lunch. You know, it's, it works for me, it's good. Life's pretty good. Unforeseen changes to your health, life or business can have a negative impact on your mental health and well-being. Support and advice from organisations not directly involved in your business can be of great benefit. RSABI is one organisation committed to supporting farmers and crofters across Scotland. So my name is Carol McLaren and I'm Chief Executive of RSABI. We're the charity that helps people in Scottish agriculture. We provide financial, um, emotional and practical support to people when they hit difficult times. I think farmers historically have always tended to work all the hours, um, work really, really hard and there just isn't the buffer when something goes wrong. So whether it's an accident or an illness or, or whatever, that buffer just isn't there. So I think the good thing is we are seeing some farmers who are really starting to think about taking um, a different approach and maybe prioritising family over the farm, trying to make changes to simplify their systems and just make things a little bit easier for them and for their lives. So there are some you know, um, indications that people are making um, some good changes, but still there's an awful lot of people that are working flat out. I think the top piece of advice um, to, to farmers or crofters who feel they might be struggling is to talk to someone, not to hesitate, not to put it off, but they feel like things are getting on top of them. Just to pick up the phone, to reach out to a friend, a neighbour, um, a family member, or to call RSABI. We have a 24-hour helpline. There's always someone there to listen, but it's crucial not to hesitate to do it, because the sooner we hear from someone, the sooner we can start to help and get them back on track. Hello everybody, uh, my name's Colin Mason. I'm one of the vets that works for SRUC Veterinary Services and I'm based down in Dumfries in South West Scotland. Uh, so we're speaking today on a beautiful cold winter's day um, in the middle of January. Um, and uh, some of the things that we've been seeing so far this year, uh, we're pretty busy uh, on the cattle side looking at um, cases of bovine abortion at the moment. Um, as the suckler herd gets towards calving, we're getting into the sort of last third of the pregnancies for a lot of these cows. So that's very often where we start to see the problems. Uh, and also in this area, we have quite a lot of seasonal calving dairy herds as well that are starting calving uh, at the end of January, beginning of February. So we're starting to see um, a cluster of uh, late embryo losses and abortions with those as well. So we're really investigating quite a few of those. Uh, we're seeing the usual mix of things that we see uh, and particularly in, in the suckler herds, one of the big risks at this time of year is um, feedborne and environmental causes. Um, so bacteria in particular, possibly fungi or yeasts as well, that come from the silage uh, and possibly come from the water troughs as well. And that's quite a big risk at this time of year. So uh, one of the things to really think about for anybody with, with cows approaching calving, seasonally calving herds with cows in the, the last third of the pregnancy now is, is to make sure that we feed them the best quality silage we've got, particularly by way of preservation 
and to be particularly careful about um, uh, areas of mould contamination, areas on the, the edges of clamps, the fronts and sides of clamps, or on the edges of bales that look, look like they might be contaminated. Because we do see uh, particular risks with uh, these sorts of bugs at this time of year. So uh, that's one to watch out for and, and to be aware of from a, a prevention point of view for the next uh, few months as we approach carving. It's interesting as well when we, we talk about the silages, I've been speaking to some of my SI, SAC consulting colleagues about the silage analysis that they've got this year. Um, and I think one of the main take home messages for me is it's very, very variable. Uh, some people have made some fantastic silage, uh, high dry matter, high energy, high protein. Others, I guess the opposite of that. And, and one of the markers for uh, possible risk from an abortion point of view would be um, the ash content of the silage. So if it's particularly high ash content, it does tend to suggest that there may be quite a bit of soil contamination at the time that the silage was made and that poses a potential risk as well. So actually knowing you know, the analysis of your silage, even at this stage of the year, knowing what it is uh, and what the potential risks of it are, are really, really important. Um, I think the other thing to mention in terms of, of cattle abortions um, is particularly at this stage of the pregnancy, towards the end of the pregnancy with suckler cows, they shouldn't be occurring. They're, they're not normal. Uh, and you know, the expectation is, is that the further a cow gets into her pregnancy, the more stable that fetus is and the more likely it is to go to term. So if you are getting problems, I think it is really, really important to investigate them, uh, to find out what the cause is. So speak to your vet or speak to um, us at SOUC Vet Services about getting them investigated. Uh, and that really, really helps with the, the health planning process. Um, uh, in terms of trying to manage these risks and, and plan for them going forwards. And, and knowing what the causes are really, really helps. I think the other thing just to point out as well is if we find nothing and we don't find an infectious cause, um, that's also really, really good news in that uh, if we screen uh, these potential risky cases and we find no evidence of infectious disease, then that's a really good outcome for the farm. And it also helps inform the health planning process as well. So I, I would really suggest, you know, a zero tolerance policy of anything that, that carves early, aborts at this late stage. Uh, get in touch with your vet and get them investigated because it's really important to know what's going on. One quick message right now, uh, it's uh, below zero degrees out here right now, even though the sun's shining. So it's a beautiful winter's day. And one of the immediate challenges right now with the cold weather to think about will be water supply, both for cattle and sheep outside and also cattle and sheep inside. Uh, we have had a, seen a couple of issues where uh, water supply has been completely frozen. Um, obviously farmers have got a, a lot of work on their, on their plates at the moment in making sure that all the water troughs and all the water supplies are defrosted and the water is flowing. Uh, and one of the risks that does occur, thankfully very, very rarely, but we do see it occasionally and we've seen it already this year, um, is, is where water supply has been interrupted to cattle or sheep is then returned and thirsty animals drink really, really quickly. Uh, and that can actually, um, in its most extreme form, actually cause sheep or cattle to be quite ill, to show nervous signs. Uh, and uh, the, the rapid drinking of a lot of water can actually cause nervous signs in these animals. So just be aware of it. Uh, and, and the main thing is, is the common sense stuff that all farmers are doing, which is, is to try and maintain water supply as much as possible, wherever possible, particularly in this cold weather. So that's one thing to think about. The other one is obviously for, for young animals, and I'm thinking particularly about dairy calves here, young dairy calves. So a newborn dairy calf at this time of year um, is particularly susceptible to the cold weather. Um, what we call the lower critical temperature for these calves, which is the temperature below which they have to use up energy to keep warm is actually 15 degrees for a newborn dairy calf. So we're way below that at the moment. Right now, we're probably about 20 degrees below that. Uh, so keeping these calves warm is absolutely critical um, to keep them healthy at the moment. So we're gonna need to supply heat for the, to do that. So uh, potentially heat lamps, uh, wearing calf jackets, ensuring that they're bedded in really, really deep straw so they can dig deep into the straw and nest in the straw, uh, trying to find sites where they're out of the wind um, and ensuring that they're not lying up against cold concrete. So possibly insulating walls of the sheds with straw uh, to keep them warm. We need to keep the air quality good. We need to keep air 
flowing above the height of these calves, but we really, really need to keep them warm at the moment because they're going to be below their lower critical temperature all the time. So uh, real things to focus on, uh, and, and that will be quite relevant for the next uh, few weeks and months, uh, given that we're only in January. So just following on from the cattle abortion stuff, obviously, uh, as we are now in mid-January, we're starting into the early lambing season for the low ground sheep flocks around here. Uh, and the same would apply there as well in that if we're getting late term, late pregnancy abortions and embryo losses uh, is, is don't hesitate to get those investigated um, to find out what the infectious causes are, if indeed they are an infectious cause, so that we can plan forward, uh, manage that for this year's lambing, uh, reduce the risks if you've got other groups of sheep that are lambing at the moment or are about to lamb, uh, and also then plan forward for next year in terms of how we're going to manage these conditions uh, and reduce the degree of embryo loss for our, our sheep flocks as things go through. Uh, so important to consider that one. The other thing at this time of year as well, there's a lot of sheep being scanned. Um, so the sort of late March and moving into the April lambing flocks are going through scans. Uh, so again, if um, depending on your scan results, most of them have been pretty good around here so far. Uh, but if you're having a, a slightly increase in barren rate, uh, is again, speak to your vet about getting that investigated. Could there be an infectious cause? Uh, could there be a nutritional cause? Could there be a management cause? Uh, but it would be worthwhile looking at some barren ewes, uh, considering what the reasons are for them not being in lamb, and then how we're gonna manage that going forward. It's also a key point in the sort of sheep's year scanning time. So it's a key time for uh, looking Looking at you body condition, how have they got through the uh, autumn and early winter so far? How are they looking in terms of body condition and how we best manage that going forward? So again, if we've got a lot of lean use, uh, it's worthwhile thinking about potential causes there. Um, uh, could there be some of the iceberg diseases that are there? And, and PM examination can really help with that. Uh, the other one that is talked about a lot at the moment is, is fluke risk. Um, and I think probably my main summary on liver fluke is, is, is that the risk is moderate and late and we would expect potentially to see some issues with liver fluke in the, in the coming weeks uh, just because of the, the warmer, wetter weather we've had, particularly in the south of Scotland through the tail end of 2023. So lots to think about there in terms of embryo loss, barren rates, abortion in cattle, abortion in sheep. Uh, liver fluke risk and, and managing forages to the best of your ability with the forages that you have to feed both late pregnant cows and also late pregnant sheep as well, the highest quality forage that you've got on the farm right now. Thanks very much for watching and listening. Uh, if you have any more queries, uh, SIUC Vet Services works as, as part of a team with your vets. So speak to your vet or speak to us about any animal health queries that you might have. Um, and the sort of veterinary team will help try and uh, work out what's best to do. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm.